Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here is your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I'm Sean Graham, coming at you today nearly live from Toronto, Ontario. We're on the campus of the University of Toronto, home of the Varsity Blues. And it's a summer day here in Toronto, and it feels like it's 40 degrees outside, or at least it was when I came in. Which means that at the end of the day, a lot of people are going to go out to a patio or people are probably sitting out on docks having a nice cold beer. And that's just part of the summer in this country. And everyone likes a nice cold one, a refreshing drink at the end of a long day. And we figured who better to come and talk to us about the history of alcohol and booze in this country than the author of Booze, A Distilled History from York University, Craig Heron. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for doing this. Hi, Sean. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Now, this book, not only is it a good book, also finalist for the Sir John A. Macdonald Prize. As I said, so booze and alcohol consumption, I think, forms a, a least to uh, maybe perhaps a stereotypical image of this country uh, to outsiders. Now, generally, though, do you think that alcohol, because it's so broad-based and a lot of people consume it, do you think it's a good way to study history? Is it an equalizer in history that it applies to micro, macro various cultural groups, it sort of goes across race and gender lines, so does that make it a, a good way to look at history? Well, I think the problem is that it sort of depends which part of history, which time period you're going to look at. There was no question that 200 years ago, everybody drank, more or less, drank something or other, and it was uh, a very important way to unify communities, and you gathered in taverns, or you gathered for special occasions, or you gathered around the table, or whatever it was, there was a lot of alcohol consumed, and, and everybody did. I think the problem is since then that it's become much more controversial. Instead of equalizing and unifying, it's actually more often been a greatly greatly divisive force. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was very interesting. Just last last week, the uh, independent grocers or or retailers in Ontario suggested to the Ontario government that they should be able to sell beer and wine in the corner stores. The response to it was a very typical response going back decades and decades. No, it's it's not a good idea. It shouldn't be too accessible, too available. So we, we have this deeply divided sense of whether drinking is a good thing or not. You're absolutely right that you'll go out in the city late this afternoon and find, find literally thousands of people mm-hmm. um, enjoying a cold drink with alcohol in, in its, in its uh, makeup. But you'll also find... Uh, that's everywhere, that sense of restraint, that, that uncertainty about whether we should actually delve in. And I'll, I'll throw into the mix, actually, that one of the things that's, that makes it even more divisive now is that the um, ethnic and racial mix that Canada has become has increased the number of cultural groups that don't incor- incorporate alcohol. So we now have hundreds of thousands of Islamic people, Muslim people in Canada, who don't drink um, and they're not part of that culture. You know, they're not going home today to drink alcohol. They right. don't drink juice or water, whatever it might be. But, and I think that's sort of buried in the declining co- consumption of alcohol since the 1970s. One of those issues has been what kind of population have we been welcoming in and where does alcohol fit in their cultures? Um, so what I found interesting about alcohol was it was everywhere. I mean, it seeped into so many issues. It was something that was talked about. People took it very centrally and seriously largely in response to the way it had been so universal 200 years ago. And, and obviously the temperance movement, the prohibition movements that came along, we're going to make um, a, quite a statement about that. But it, it became not something that was unifying, but something that was actually divisive. And it, even the places that people chose to drink could be seen as off-limits. You know, right. Over the years, I've met a number of women older than me, who, you know, my mother's generation, and even some of my generation who talk about how they were warned to walk on the other side of the street from a beverage room because those are dangerous places and you wouldn't want to go near them, right? And the men who staggered out of there might have cost a woman on the street, supposedly, whatever. It probably didn't happen very much, but it was yeah. still, there was this sense that in a, in a neighborhood, and especially in smaller town Canada, smaller cities, that these were not safe places and these were not welcoming places and they were places you should stay away from if you mm-hmm. were respectable or, or female. <laughs> Well, actually, there's a place in Ottawa that I went, and I went for, it was American Thanksgiving, so we went to watch football during the afternoon, and it was an old place, and it had two different rooms. One was really small, and that was where, well, it was for the women, 
and then there was the big room. Not anymore, but that's when it was originally built. And then there was the two different sections, that I, <laughs> which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, well, that started with the end of Prohibition in the 30s. They, mm. they put in beer parlors across the country. Um, and not every province did this, but Ontario was one of the few that did. That said, okay, women should be allowed to drink, but they have to be in separate spaces for ladies and escorts. And escorts. <laughs> which meant they... That single men couldn't go in there on their own. Yes. A uh, man and a woman could go in together, but groups of women could go in together, too. Mm. So I found lots of reports of young women leaving the factory and going to have a drink on a Friday night together. Mm, interesting. Like there's, there's a good quote that I like from the book that sort of speaks to this. It says, although drinking together can on, on often affirm social relationships, it can also be an expression of liberty and independence and therefore appear threatening and subversive. And you, this is at the section that starts talking about the prohibition movement and how it was very much driven by social classes uh, and how the upper class saw lower class people drinking and how they thought this was threatening, in a sense, correct? Well, it was a little more complicated than that. There were a group of overwhelmingly middle class people and rural people, rural uh, well-off farmers, um, who objected to what alcohol did to daily life who mm-hmm. thought that the, the kind of undisciplined, freewheeling uh, behavior that came from drinking was a problem. That included some respectable, skilled working men who also uh, participated. So the big, the big labor movement of the 1880s, the Knights of Labor, it, um, which was in many communities across the country, was completely committed to temperance, and they, they wouldn't welcome into their ranks anyone who ran a saloon, for example. But below that, there was lots of, obviously lots of drinking uh, amongst working men who had begun to see uh, taverns and, and saloons as their gathering place after work and had all sorts of important bonding functions going on there. But what I also discovered was at the top of society, in the book there's a picture of a, a very elegant dinner party in Montreal in the early 1900s, and you can see about four different glasses in front of each dinner guest. Right? Okay. And, and, the cook, and the cookbooks that gave advice about organizing fancy dinners talked about which order the champagne and the sherry and the, the <laughs> claret should go in and so on. So it was, it was never a straightforward upper class versus lower class. What okay. did become the, the kind of class-based issue was when the temperance movement decided they were going to focus on banish the bar. Mm. Uh, anti-saloon activity right. and that meant the focus then became the space in working class communities where men, working class men would gather you know, after work or whenever to drink and that's what they wanted to shut down that became like the sort of central drive and there was a lot of resentment against that even by teetotaling working men who said hey what about the private clubs where the rich can go and drink and it's, it's not fair to be so compulsive we should talk people out of drinking, we shouldn't force them to have no options. Um, and by the end of the First World War, the labor movement was, a huge chunk of the labor movement was organizing to try and get beer back. This was a working man's drink, it was perfectly respectable and so on. But in terms of, of divisions of class, it was, it was very, mu- very much more complicated than s- sort of a straightforward social control model that, right. that really dominated a lot of thinking many years, I think people mm. thought that that's what the temperance movement was all about. But the upper, uh, there are hints that in the upper class circles, they absolutely hated the temperance people. They thought they were okay. just too extreme, too over the top. And you don't find those kinds of, of key um, elite people speaking from platforms of the temperance movement. Local businessmen, you might, who are concerned about their own factory. Sure. By the early 20th century, you don't find and then all of this, of course, there's an added dimension of races involved in all of this too, right? Like you mentioned before that there's a changing population now of groups of people who don't drink. And before there was notions of it wasn't acceptable for some races to drink. And so that's tempered into this as well. Absolutely. Look, the first and most important starting point is, of course, Aboriginal peoples were told they couldn't drink at all. Of course. The, the, the Indian Act said absolutely not. And even when Prohibition ended and Ontario set up its beverage rooms where you could get just beer and nothing else. They sent out central, I, looked, I saw the memos on this, they sent out memos every single day to all of the branches. I'm sorry, I'm one step ahead of myself. It was the liquor stores, not the beverage rooms. The liquor stores uh, who were, that were set up in 1927. Um, they, the LCBO sent out messages every day, and one of those was a kind of clarification of what to do about anyone who showed up who looked to be an Indian. 
Okay. And whether or not they were status Indians or uh, franchise Indians who had, who had left the reservation and accepted, anyone who looked like one wasn't going to be served. They were told, the staff was told not to serve them. So that was one line. The other was that in, in a lot of ways it was more informal. Drinking was something you did with people you felt comfortable with. Right. You would gather together in ways to re- reinvigorate, to strengthen the bonds that existed amongst you. A group of working people who work in the same place, the people who live in the same neighborhood. They didn't like to have in that same space people they were uncomfortable with. Hmm. So that meant, even before you got to the formal um, color line, that people from Eastern Europe, for example, weren't welcome in some of those places. Um, and what began to happen in many cities was that we're drinking spots that would be much more for immigrants, uh, you know, people who were not white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Small, much smaller numbers of them, but they were they were there. And as for blacks, um, they were quite regularly excluded. And even in the era of the LCBO in the 1930s and 40s, there are complaints that flow in to the head office saying, uh, you know, I, I went in and asked for a drink and, and they wouldn't give it to me. And the, the law at that point didn't prohibit that. So uh-huh. the response was, well, it's probably better that he doesn't drink there because it would just upset things and it would be harder to manage. So lots of groups thought they would like to participate in a drinking culture, but the cultures were not uh, inclusive. They were exclusive. Right. So essentially, it's almost like privately drinking can create communities and be inclusive, but publicly it can be divisive. And that's... It's, create these social anxieties and yeah. raise tensions, yeah. which is really interesting. Yeah. Now, it, do you, would you say that one of those elements is stronger than the other? Does does the private relationships and the private communities that outweigh the social anxieties, or are, are these two things just engaging in a constant struggle with each other? Well, I think it's not <clears throat> it's not just driven by the issue of drinking. It's like where, where are race and ethnic right. relations in a society at that point? Yeah. So since the Second World War, when we've had much more official government policy that says discrimination is unacceptable, and when companies can you know, no longer discriminate, and in fact workers of different ethnic and racial backgrounds find themselves working side by side in the same factory floor and so on, I think there's more integration than there was, right. than more ease. Uh, ease in it. And of course, in a city like Toronto now, and, and any of the metropolitan cities in Canada that are so multiracial and multi ethnic, you can walk into any bar and see a, a huge mix of people. Sure. It's just, it's, th- that is less of an issue anymore than, to, to a great extent, than class. I mean, there are certain bars that set their prices so that they're not going to get yeah. the construction worker or the laborer wandering yeah. in and who have dress standards that would make it difficult. And there are places, the sports bars, where you can wander in dressed as you like, yep. just enjoy yourself in a very relaxed way, and uh, the guys from Rosedale are not going to go in there. Right. Yeah. Right. And then there's bars around here that walk in from Union Station up here that are clearly for students. Yeah. Uh, people under 25. and there's, Yeah, so there's definitely different, different types of places. Now, the book doesn't just cover the 20th century. It goes all the way back to the start to the first settlements, the French and British settlements, and it talks about how alcohol formed an important part of those settlements and those communities. So would, you, would it be fair to say, then, that, that alcohol forms a portion of our shared national culture and, and is an important part of our country's history from settlement and could almost be seen as a staple? It's interesting you, you pose that question because way back in the 1950s, there was a popular historian named Merrill Dennison who wrote a lot of books, but he wrote one on the Molsons. Okay. And he makes this very point. Yeah. He said, in the early 19th century, the production of beer was so important in Canada that we should be considering it a staple. This, uh, right off the top, there is an issue about Native peoples, um, yes. because they didn't have alcohol in their cultures before the Europeans arrived. And they incorporated it, the, the European alcohol into their cultures in a very different way, um, in, a, in a kind of ritualistic binge drinking that was a byproduct of the trading relationship where they would trade, then they would get drunk in, 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 to a degree that was not typical of Europeans. Well, lots of Europeans got very drunk. But as part of a, um, as we now understand it, part of a way in which they re- were re- reinforcing their spiritu- spirituality and that this was part of the dream uh, experience. So they were not so fully ex- included, although as time went on, the, the penetration of alcohol into their communities that became more and more destructive was uh, making them more part of the, the same experience. As for the other, I mean, I, 
it's it was so widespread and so common, no one would stop to think about it as a unifier or non unifier. Right. The, the the critical thing though um, was what did you drink? Oh, okay. Because even to, to today, what the the, the uh, alcohol producers have to struggle with are regional preferences in drinking. But that goes back a long way. Mm -hmm. So in New France, there was a heavy preference for wine, uh, for wine in the upper classes, but for brandy. Okay. And uh, beer was not as, as popular uh, until really until after the conquest, when Molson and others began to introduce uh, new breweries. On the, on the East Coast, rum was the big deal because the, the triangular relationship with the West Indies. There was oh, you're getting all the sugar. Exactly. And, and the first distillery that set up is a rum distillery in Halifax. In central Canada, whiskey is the big deal because there's so much extra, extra grain that right. farmers can take off to the local distiller, who's just probably the grain merchant up the road. So regional drinking cultures really got deeply embedded early on. And even once beer gets established, local breweries are very, uh, have very limited consumer markets until well into the 20th century. And as a consequence, regional drinking has very strong um, associations. And after Prohibition ends, the provincial governments all have separate uh, restrictive legislation yeah. governing consumption of alcohol. And most of them want to promote the, the beer that's being produced, the alcohol that's being produced in their own province. So these walls go up between provinces. Yeah. That mean that you drop down in a city, and this still has, it, despite the era of free trade, this has lingered on in some ways. You drop down in Calgary or Coover or Halifax or St. John or something, and an entirely different range of beers would be available. And the yeah. ones you're used to back home wouldn't be there. Yeah. So, you know, back you know, 50 years ago, Keith's in, in the East and Dow in Montreal and uh, various others out west. Um, Great Western Pilsner. <laughs> which all meant that a unifying culture actually in the sense of everyone sitting down together but there was a, a funny kind of competitiveness about which right. beer was better which, which uh, whether whiskey or, or rum was better those sorts of stuff so, um, because because it's interesting because like I think of that new Sleeman's campaign where they really set themselves up as a national brand and we've been here forever and we're clearly a part of the national fabric but yeah who owns them yeah Sapporo <laughs> <It's a laughs> but yeah but as you're but as you're saying it's really more of a regional if there's and re these regional distinctions. It is, um, it is the case that in the 1950s, the, and be, even a bit before that, after the Second World War, the big beer producers tried to produce the national beer that everyone would drink, yes. 50 export, essentially. And to some extent, they were successful, but they could never get past the regional loyalties of a lot of these people and the provincial policies that meant they had to keep brewing locally mm -hmm. um, in order to sell in the province, mm -hmm. which they thought was hugely inefficient. And that lasted until the 1990s. You know, that was, that was the era of free trade that forced the provinces to actually take down their barriers. So to, your question was about the colonial period. In some ways, I think it would be saying, like, eating meat was a unifying yeah. factor or something, because it was so universal. It was, right. No one made a big deal out of it, except to the extent that it was a celebratory experience in, in many cases to consume it, and therefore there would be some shared sense of that. But I very much doubt that anyone would have traveled to visit New France from the, the English-speaking part of the world if they'd been allowed to, and said, well, they drink just like us. <laughs> they probably didn't. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, so you're talking about being prevalent then through the colonial period, and then we get into the, the national period and through the 20th century, and the book traces the changes in consumption through the 20th century, which, I, and I think it's really interesting to, to see how it, there's this ebb and flow and how it changes based on different concepts of health and what people think is healthy at the time. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a really unfair question. In general, how would you characterize the change in consumption through the early national period? That's about half the book. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's why it's an unfair question. <laughs> well, there are a few uh, outstanding things. Obviously, the Prohibition Dance is the great monument in the middle that you have to stumble over. You can't, you can't get around the fact that in, for many decades before that, there had been a heavy campaign to try and restrict the access of, of alcohol in communities. And that got um, more intense during the First World War, and then by the end of the war, all the provinces, with the partial exception of Quebec, had banned it, and then several provinces kept that going after. What that had done was turn alcohol into a less respectable, increasingly less respectable, drinking alcohol into a less respectable practice. 
and so you know at the at the bottom of society at the very top people had just grumbled and said no this isn't a, uh, this was unrespectable it's actually quite pleasant we would like to continue doing it and they, and they went back to it as soon as they had a chance to what it did however was entrench uh, um, well what prohibition did was prove that people were deeply ambivalent about this there was a formal culture of repression that was put in place with a whole apparatus for shutting down bootlegging and uh, curbing rum running and making drunkenness more legally reprehensible uh, uh, practice and so on. But in actual fact, thousands and thousands of people found their way to alcohol during Prohibition. And Mm -hmm. it was, as I say in the book, it's one of the the most massive forms of civil disobedience in Canadian history. Um, And the law enforcement officers, especially locally, began to just go with the flow and, and not really seriously try and repress it. But it, And so it wasn't too hard to argue by the end of, well, in Ontario in 1927 and different provinces at different points, to argue this had been a failure, it hadn't worked. But it had set up a standard that said, well, we can't go back to a freewheeling era of the saloon where people can just wander in, drink as much as they like, stand, stagger out onto the street, and uh, break windows or whatever. In actual fact, that was a pretty minority behavior. I argue in the book that pre-prohibition drinking was actually pretty moderate and, and for the most part, not as, as damaging as a lot of the prohibition people suggested. But we'd set up this double standard. And so bringing back new legislation that made it possible but difficult and as unpleasant as possible. Right. So you went into a liquor store, it was like going into a bank. You couldn't actually see the product. Yeah. Um, and you get the, the bottle handed to you through a grill, wrapped in paper, you're supposed mm-hmm. to take it home and drink it. You go into a, a beverage room up until they brought in the, the cocktail lounges of the 1940s and 50s. Uh, up until that point, you went into a beverage room where you couldn't stand up, you couldn't walk around with your drink, you were not not allowed to sing, not allowed to eat, not allowed to have, have any entertainment, not allowed to play any games. It was a very narrow experience in which, and these were really uh, severely unpleasant places. There was nothing on the walls but a calendar or two. They were just basic, and, and that was assumed that you didn't want these places to be too pleasant. So that continued on in a whole lot of ways, that, that, that drinking was not really a very good thing. Right? And at the same time, however, enough people thought it was that the kind of attitude to alcohol as being somehow s- slightly disreputable, but that was, that's what makes it fun. Right, yeah, yeah, that um, forbidden fruit sort of idea. Exactly. Yeah. Many several years ago, my my father um, got himself involved at a, late in life with a woman next door, and they spent five happy years together in their late seventies and early eighties before she died. And she was a war bride who came over to Canada in nineteen forty six, and she went to I think Womanville. I, I, it, it's stories in the book, but it's one of those small towns along the lake, which was officially dry, and. Her, they moved in with her mother, with her husband's family, and her mother-in-law was adamant there would be no drinking in the house. This was completely unacceptable and, you know, very stern teetotaler. And this was a shock to a woman who'd grown up where going down to the local pub was just part of what you did in Britain, the part of Britain she grew up in. Not to get drunk, but just to have a nice, friendly, social uh, engagement with your neighbors. Then she discovered that her father-in-law and his friends would go into the basement the back under the barn and crack old bottles of beer and have a good time. <laughs> and to me, that epitomized the hypocrisy and mm-hmm. dichotomy in Canadian attitude to drinking that had settled in by the middle of the 20th century. And that I said earlier, has really not completely gone. Yeah. That in some ways, we're quite ambivalent about it. But by that point, the most important change, I think, is that women have been integrated into public drinking cultures. The the decision to create ladies and escorts rooms was a huge departure from the era of the saloon where there were no men, and where, I'm sorry, where there were only men, but there were no women, and where drinking together was part of the the male bonding that would go on amongst different groups of people, not from all, all social classes and ethnic groups and so on, but the ones that felt comfortable about it. And it was part of, and had been for centuries in many different cultures, that drinking was a way of, set, of setting yourself apart from the women folk who were supposed to be looking after the domestic sphere. So bringing them into the culture, even in that limited way, is having to be with escorts yeah. in a, session, a section of the bar that's called uh, for ladies and escorts, was a, a big change. And of course, by the 60s and 70s, those kinds of restrictions came yeah. off. That In the 70s, they took those labels off officially and 
Mm-hmm. I, it's been a very long time since I passed a bar that still has them. Right? Yes, yeah. uh, and by the 70s, we were back to a much more freewheeling sense of uh, sure. possibilities of what, where you could drink publicly, whether anyone could see you drinking. This was a big issue. you know. So mm-hmm. the outdoor pa- patios were up for boating in Canada until the 1970s. Yeah. And you know, they closed Young Street one summer, and this was a big issue, whether how high the shrubs had to be around the outdoor patio in case anyone walking by could actually okay, see what you're thinking. <laughs> now, of course, that's not yeah. existing. Now, you, you talk about how it's prohibition culture, this almost making alcohol a bit of a taboo, lingers to today. Do you think that that is dangerous and actually harmful? Because I'm thinking of people when they turn 19, hey, I can go drink, let's go to the bar and just get just stupid just having these restrictions make it more alluring and given that it can be dangerous do these restrictions actually work counter to what they're trying to do do you think it's hard to know anymore um, yeah. i mean the restrictions have loosened considerably I right. mean, the hours have been extended till two in the morning for example in this province the liquor stores are not you know liquor control board of ontario give me a break you walk into <laughs> one of some of the fanciest ritziest retail stores they give you a free magazine to tell you what to consume with every meal and how you can use alcohol in every recipe they give free wine tasting sessions in the stores mm-hmm. i mean these some of them have kitchen there too the one in auto has a full kitchen like a kitchen really? in the back where they'll do like cooking displays so you can take like a class and then they show you what to have with whatever they make I didn't realize that (laughs) it's moving right along oh god so I think the restrictions are you know the fact that you can't get it at corner stores I just I have a new neighbor who's only been in Canada for four years he's from the states and he was Mm -hmm. telling me when I met him a couple weeks ago that you know he can't get used to this there should you know all the private liquor stores in the states give you more competition more choice and whatnot. but that seems to me that's an issue of consumer policy it's not an issue yeah. of re- restriction or, or non-restriction because in actual fact it's not hard to get alcohol here so that's that's the first part I guess I'm I'm not so convinced that the heavy drinking the binge drinking that goes on in Canada is driven by how disreputable this pleasure is as much as it's become part of particular groups young 19 year old men is a good category yeah. to set up but you know the statistics show that young men in their 20s are way out in front in terms of alcohol consumption right. and that they're, it's going up quite, quite dramatic whereas in the rest of the population there's there's been less uh, increase and in some cases decline from the 1970s to the 1990s and the book sort of peters off in the 90s but there had actually been a decline in consumption. It was just that it was sh- it was shifting into... Well, it may not have been shifting. It may have been that the federal government surveys were now more pointed and, and more more uh, effective in exposing this than maybe that they'd always been so set up. Uh, they'd always had those kind of age differences. It's still a gender difference, too. Women are drinking more, but still far less than men. Right. So it's there's no question that drinking alcohol still is connected with asserting whatever version of masculinity you are uh, uh, close to. And, and mm-hmm. for young men, it's it's a kind of, it's a ritual pattern of, of getting acceptance in, a, in the group. That, and it's, it's absolutely true that, that buying a, a case of beer is not to enjoy the taste of each bottle that you drink it at that age. Right. It's simply yeah. how many can you get through out quickly. Yeah. And then feel the effects. Which is why all the bland national brands sell so well that's exactly right and why Lakeport which was selling them a buck a buck a bottle yeah. for so long was doing very well because that was all people wanted was to yeah. <laughs> no I, I'm I, I'm not sure what our I think there's uh, there are issues in, in, in the broader Canadian culture about restraint and and, uh, mm. and engagement with more expressive forms of social behavior that not everyone is comfortable with right. uh, and I think what's happened is that, that it's there are pockets of Canadians, large pockets, that participate or not participate and participate to limited extents. Social drinking is widespread. Heavy drinking is much less widespread. Sure. Um, abstinence, com- complete abstinence, is actually uh, more widespread now than it's been for a long time. And I think that probably has something to do with ethnic, racial and ethnic differences. But it doesn't seem to have the same... You mentioned this in the book, too. There's not that same effort to have just alcohol be done with. That the people who aren't drinking just aren't going to participate, and they're fine. But they're fine with the other people participating. So there doesn't uh, seem to be as divisive. No, and the issue has really become harm reduction. Right. Like the the concern is if you're drinking a lot, are you going to get in behind the wheel of a car? Yeah. Are you 
going to drink a lot while you have a, a fetus in your as a pregnant woman? Are you uh, uh, going to rampage through a neighborhood drunk late at night? I mean, there there's social behavior that's unacceptable, and that various measures have been in, introduced to try and cons- control. And sometimes those concerns have been focused as as a neo temperance movement, mm-hmm. but they haven't they haven't moved in the direction of saying drinking is totally wrong and mm-hmm. is immoral in the ways that would have been said 100 years ago. And of course, the neo-temperance movement reminds me, when you asked me about what changed in the 20th century, we also got to a very new period after the Second World War thinking about what alcoholism is, like mm-hmm. drinking too much, not just binge drink, but a kind of dependency on alcohol, which got very narrowly defined around a particular part of the population who couldn't deal with it, and got very medicalized. So all institutes were set up to study it, special institutions were set up for responding to it. And the most amazing voluntary organization, Alcoholics Anonymous, was set up for helping people deal with it. And that lingers on. You know, it's interesting. I, I actually find it interesting how often people I, I meet socially, or even my students, will use the word alcoholic the way I think in the 19th century people would have said drunkard. Just right. someone who drinks too much. Right. It's not the, the legal definition. There is no legal definition. It's not the sort of clinical definition of an alcoholic. It's just, I, you know, he has a habit of drinking too much. Right. He's an alcoholic. Yeah. So we have it's this more of a colloquial yeah, term. Exactly. So, and I think that helped to shape the debate to some extent. You know, the mm-hmm. public policy side gets heavy in, uh, in injections of, of concern from the old Addiction Research Foundation, which is now part of CAMH. And their concern was don't not access more because our studies show that whenever this happens across the world, countries that have done that, then there are social implications that are very severe suicide and, and such like. And the World Health Organization says the same thing. So that in Canada, that's been and here in Ontario in particular, that's been a very powerful lobbying voice. Every time there's an issue about making alcohol more accessible, they're right there at the forefront saying this is a bad idea. Right. And not for the old moral ideas. It's, it's moralistic uh, reasons that, that the temperance movement of the past would have used, but more for they're more scientifically based. Mm-hmm. Uh, Which is interesting, too, because at the same time you have studies come out seemingly all the time talking about the benefits of moder- moderate drinking. Exactly. And so there's this weird balance. Like, there's like my parents, I think it was in the mail, got one of these pamphlets about how much you can drink and how much you should and what you should and shouldn't do. And Who sent it? I, I have no idea. Oh. But it was, on the, it was in the junk mail pile when I got home the other day. That's, that's kind of weird. Well, the interesting thing about that is I, I don't think that most medical or public health people would recommend that people drink right. a glass of wine every day or whatever, yeah. even though consistently now the studies are saying that that, that kind of moderate level is pretty good for your heart. Yeah. And, but there's still a really strong reaction against that because of the concern, the greater concern in our, in our official and, and public culture about excessive drinking. Yeah. So you don't want to encourage it. Right. Now... To go back a step, we're talking about the, the socialization part of alcohol and consuming alcohol. Why do you think it's alcohol specifically that has become the socializing factor? Why can't it be orange juice, or why can't like why alcohol specifically, and why has it had this draw to it for you know a thousand years? Well, the short, the one way answer is to say coffee is, has become a, a, a right. an important second uh, option, uh, depending on what time of day you're meeting. Yeah. But. No, that's um, true, actually. Yeah, you meet somebody. If it's in the morning, you want to go for a coffee. We'll have a meeting. We'll have a coffee. In the afternoon, we'll go for a drink, and we'll talk about it. Yeah, that's true. Last fall, I, I was on antibiotics, and it really screwed up my digestive system, and I went off both coffee and alcohol. And believe me, it was really awkward, because yeah. there were many moments when I'd just say, it's okay, I'll just have some water. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can't do it. Yeah, like, people don't gather no. around water. No. <laughs> right. no, you go, especially like I curl in the winter. You go to the curling club, and I know one guy a couple of times has just gotten like a Gatorade after, and everyone looks at everyone looks at him funny, like what are you doing? So, but so what is what is what do you think that draw to alcohol is then? Well, I I think probably it's there's no question that the effect of alcohol, yeah. moderate though it may be depending on your consumption, is still has always been recognized as a relaxing force or something that uh, stimulates your system in some particular way that, that makes you feel more pleasant. It's been around, I mean, literally 5,000 years, more or less, that right. we know people have been drinking socially, been drinking alcohol in some way or other, all over the world, just about every culture. So there was something about it, and it, it was because there were all the drinks varied tremendously, but the single 
constant was the alcohol part of it, right? So it must have been the effect of the alcohol that, that people appreciated. You know, North American native peoples who didn't have alcohol did have um, tobacco or yeah. um, they had other rit- rituals that probably didn't have much of a psychotropic effect on the body, but did uh, provide a similar kind of feeling of, of, yeah. of mutuality. Um, so I guess I don't have a, a straightforward answer to it. It, it. Just descriptively, we know it's always happened. Yeah. Right. And that it's been a particularly important part of the way that men want to come together. Right. Um, and that's, that seems to have not changed, right? Exactly. I mean, women will be incorporated, women will go drinking themselves, but there's it's still, if you go out into a sports bar, you'll see you know, yeah. 75% men. Yeah. So in, in having this culture of socialization with alcohol, like, does it say something about us as a country or something about us as our patriotism that in the last 20 years perhaps the biggest expression of nationalism has been a beer advertisement? Does that, does that surprise you? Or? Well, that commercial took everybody by surprise. Right? Yeah. Um, as an actual fact, we're more likely to express ourselves through either sports yeah. and watch, you know, what are we watching for the next two weeks? Yeah. Uh, the Olympics, or donuts and coffee. <laughs> In a bunch of ways, Tim Hortons is a more powerful unifier. Mm. Um, even though, in many ways, coffee, uh, the donut shop was a fairly regional culture, as Steve Penfold's book on donut uh, in Canada made it made clear. It has spread across the country, but I'm not sure that that ten years. It's been about ten years since that commercial came out. Yeah, I think at least. Yeah. Yeah, I think they. Uh, I think I actually saw some st- discussion of, of it as an tenth an- anniversary sometime. Okay. So. I'm not sure people would still look to it in the same way. I mean, right. nationalism is very weak in Canada yeah. in, in those forms. Uh, we tend to rally around events that take place usually on the sporting fields, you know. Like yeah. That's a great deal more excitement will come from winning a major hockey game or winning enough medals but half decent at the Olympics. Uh, I think what that commercial was trying to do as much as anything was to say we have a distinctive drinking culture. Yeah. <laughs> we drink something that's very specific. The irony of that is that it's no longer just Molson's Export and, and the Labatt's 50 that are trying to establish a national drinking pattern. Most of the, bre- of the brewers and distillers are multinational giants now, are owned by multinationals. So all the major Canadian breweries now are owned by multinationals. And the, the goal is to have one big national drink that is as bland as possible so it can be <laughs> sold everywhere. And, the, the, of course, the driving wedge of this was Budweiser. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, if you look at you know Corona from Mexico, if you look at Stella Artois uh, from France, if you know go, go down the list, none of them are very distinctive beers. They don't. They're, right. they're not really flavorful. They're not objectionable in any way. They're not as as bland as the old American, as, as Budweiser really is yeah. when it's produced at home, where a lot of American beers are. But the idea is as much as possible to have a beer that will be drunk on as many continents as possible. So. A drinking culture increasingly isn't even what it once was. Right. Like bars that offer you 42 different kinds of beers, although increasingly those are, 35 of them are made locally, <laughs> so that's a, a huge change. Yeah. But those are just uh, local peculiarities. They're not, I think, I think that the idea of internationalizing our drinking culture is part of internationally, uh, internationalizing almost everything right. as much as possible, yeah. globalizing our attitudes to leisure. I, I read a really good book a, f- a couple or three years ago about vacations around the world and how there's a kind of package vacation that is provided everywhere in basically the same form. It has to include a beach, it has to include a hotel and certain features that have to go with yeah. those but uh, and certain activities that are supposed to go along. But it's amazing how that's being replicated everywhere. And the notion that you would provide something special and different yeah. Um, in your own reach, as once would be the case. Sure, uh, yeah. You know, 100 years ago when people went traveling, they were looking for distinctiveness. Now people want sort of reliable comfort. And I think drinking called drinking products, alcoholic products, have become more and more in that vein. Try and get more market share, but don't do it by being too distinctive. Because right. <laughs> in Canada, the problem for beer manufacturers, for brewers, is that the market is not growing. It's right. you know it's guys like you yeah. who are, who are at the central core of their market, but what they want is you to shift to, to shift brands. So it's all about market share. Right. And if it goes half a percentage point, that is millions of dollars. Yeah. So that's their goal. One thing I found found interesting though in talking about how, and you talk about this in the book a little bit, talking about how 
prominent alcohol and, food and alcohol consumption is and has been, yet, and we're okay with people like me and people like you going out and having a drink, yet if one of our politicians does it, we don't like that. And Sir John A. Macdonald, you could argue that he may have had an alcohol problem, yet, and people sort of look down on that. And whenever an, uh, a politician has a drink or as the slightest thing, and the, there's, I think the one example was, was it Premier of British Columbia? Yeah. In the 90s, he had a drunk driving arrest, and he said that he has to fix his... Uh, Tears in his eyes. Yes, <laughs> that it was, it was his drinking problem, as opposed to that maybe he, maybe he shouldn't be driving. That's right, it was like, a driving problem. Not yeah, <laughs> it was not a drinking problem. So how do we, as a, as a society, like, how, how, does that say anything about us? Or, or do you think this is also part of that remnant from that prohibition movement and the teetotalers? No, I think it does. It, 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 it is back to that way in which on one level we think we're, un- we're uncomfortable with excessive drinking mm-hmm. um, moderate drinking is okay social drinking is okay but keep it really moderate uh, in any kind of official, official and public way private uh, uh, excessive drinking of any kind well excessive is the wrong word consuming a lot of alcohol <laughs> not putting value judgment on it um, is not so good and uh, the key thing is I think and I argue this at the very end of the book Keep it to yourself. Try and keep it private. Try and keep it out of public eye. Right. And it's okay. You can sort of pass public scrutiny that way. It's when it explodes into anything else. You know, the implications of the, di- the discussion I referred to a while back about um, the corner stores in Ontario wanting last week wanting to have alcohol, is, and the response was, you can't let too much get out there because it m- might lead to too much you know, right. excessive drinking, even though south of the border... There's it's no, all over no the evidence that there's a hugely greater drinking problem in the United States with um, much looser access to, to alcohol. But we do, we still think our public leaders should fall into a kind of mold of, of you know, prohibition era yeah. <laughs> stalwart character. Yeah. And it's interesting, John A. McDonald, there's a whole article now on his drunkenness, which I, I think has got it wrong. Because, in fact, in, in his era, he was a, a kind of transitional figure. Young man, he was part of cultures where it was very common to drink a lot, yeah. and regularly. And uh, that just was part of his life. And mm-hmm. the fact that he organizes campaigns out of taverns, that was what people did. Right? Yeah. It got less and less respectable as the 19th century went on, and he had to deal with it. I don't think I ended up using it in the book, but I have a picture of, maybe I did, a Tory, of a conservative... Uh, National convention in the 1880s, and they're all standing up with their glasses. You know, <laughs> it's uh, one of the, mo- the most. Uh, there, there's so many stories of, of hypocrisy that enter into these. Yeah, uh, these kinds of issues. Yeah, it definitely. Yeah, it definitely says something about our leaders and the fact that at uh, at the Civ Museum in Ottawa, I guess in Gatineau, they have Sir John A. Macdonald's flask on display in the head-to-head exhibit, which is up above Canada Hall, and they have prominent people and little sections on each of them, and his flask is prominently displayed <laughs> in his section. And it's, so it's interesting that that's, what we, that's a main thing that we remember about him, that that was out, an outstanding feature, despite the fact that for his time, and even today, he'd probably still he'd fit in, right? It didn't seem like he was too excessive. Maybe today it would be seen, seen as excessive. The other, th- the other way of answering your question is that is not just to look at the people who are trying to repress, but one of the things that the, the restrictive legislation did was to accentuate the, the desire to drink quickly because the hours were short and the days were limited, so you couldn't drink on Sundays, the hours. Even before Prohibition, bars closed at 7 o'clock on Saturday night in, the, in Ontario. Oh, yeah, you, should, you just find that it's incredible. That cuts out like seven it's hours so, of drink. It's still light outside. Yeah, so if you're working as people did five and a half or six days a week and you've only got an hour or two before it's going to close you get off work heading straight yeah. to the bar you're going to drink as fast as you possibly sure. can and I've, I've known people who lived in Australia and New Zealand where this was a huge problem because the, that, that restriction lasted well through the 20th century and there'd be guys who leave work drink like crazy stagger home yeah. <laughs> people throwing up in the streets because they've yeah. got empty stomachs and so on but I think that encouraged a binge kind of drinking that became a real contrast with countries where a more repressive approach to alcohol never entered in. So with obvious uh, qualifications, places like Spain and Italy and Portugal and France don't have the same issue around binge drinking, whereas the countries that had more repressive legislation, like 
Britain, uh, Britain to some extent, mostly in the hours of legislation, Scandinavia, Canada, and the United States, those places have had huge problems with binge drinking. Right. So I think that part of what people are responding to now is the kind of drinking cultures that emerge from a more repressive approach. Yeah. Also in a country where we had lots of communities with excessive numbers of young men, unattached young men, who were yes. you know, in, on the frontier or wherever it might be, for whom there was nothing much to do but drink. And yeah, and even today, I, I have friends who live in Alberta, and they say whenever the guys from the rigs come in, if you're in a bar and a bunch of the guys from the rigs come in, you, you should just leave. Yeah. But they're just going to go crazy. Well, Fort McMurray is apparently just <laughs> yeah. full of that kind of behavior, along with excessive drug use, which is, yeah. again, I use the word, uh, ex- <laughs> extensive drug <laughs> yes, use. <laughs> yes. So I think we're living with a legacy of, it, you know, in some ways, as historians, we can stop to look at how is public behavior over long periods of time shaped by public policy mm-hmm. and public and private behavior, actually. And one of the things that this shows us is that, in fact, you can have unexpected consequences that will have, con- that will flow for generations afterwards that then become built into our our cultural responses to drinking, right. drinking alcohol. There isn't an easy other way of thinking about how we end up in this kind of contradictory space, yeah. you know, and where for the most part, there's, there's not a single politician at Queen's Park or in Ottawa or any of the provincial capitals, with the exception of a few evangelical Protestants in the back benches, who would say it is inappropriate to be drinking. And yeah. on all, all those you know, occasions, public occasions, there'll be alcohol provided if the government can, can afford it. Yeah. So publicly, it's okay. And every one of them will have it in their homes and they're, they're, if they're entertaining and there will be, you know, it's notorious at party conventions, political party conventions, but it's the potential for excess that always seems to hover yeah. and the potential for it becoming a dependency and therefore alcoholism that seems to make the public debate about it more restrained and more concerned. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a, I won't say who, but I was walking down the street uh, in front of Parliament, and I was just walking by, and there was an MP, and I'm assuming an aide or an assistant or something. And it was a Friday around 1 or something, and I guess the MP was leaving for the day. And the guy said to him, so do you, have, you got enough whiskey to get you through the weekend? And I was just taken aback by that. First, I don't know why. I shouldn't have been, because if it was you know, some regular 30-year-old guy saying it to some other guy, like I would have noticed. But because there was an MP... I'm thinking, whoa, really? You're saying this on the street? Like, uh, so, yeah, it, it is. It is part of that weird dimension that, uh, that you've talked about. The other dimension of this that we haven't talked about is how it's become that the consumption of it has become woven into new patterns of consumerism. Right. Um, when I started drinking, you went into a, a bar and, and you just asked for a, a pitcher of beer. I mean, because there was probably only one thing on tap. Right? Yeah. But now the the sort of connoisseur of beer or of particular wines obviously and people are much fussier about wines than they used to be and cocktails and whatnot mixed drinks it it's a world of uh, discriminating tastes that, yes. that's emerging right and that has nothing to do with the debate about whether or not it should be repressed or made more accessible but it does mean that it's it encourages an integration of it into a consumerist society for people who have lots of money and are, are interested in mm-hmm. spending their money carefully. One of the things that the, the yuppie generation of, of uh, baby boomers brought was a, a real interest in fine quality everything, right? Yes. <laughs> the, the quality of everything mattered, starting with crunchy granola in the morning and going to the best wine at dinner at night. Yeah. You know, and That's why you can't get a cup of coffee anymore. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, just a regular cup of coffee that doesn't exist. <laughs> and I spent part of Saturday afternoon in a, in a Starbucks, and I realized that's absolutely true. I, I, was, yeah. I don't go into Starbucks very often, but yeah. I, it was almost like I was going through a translation of what yeah. I wanted. So yeah. Could you please? What's the English word for this? Yeah. <laughs> but and, and it's it's interesting too. I think that that talk about consumerism and all this can even be. I, I look at the, the character Fraser Crane that on Cheers. He just goes and he drinks beer and he's a regular guy. And then on Fraser, he's drinking sherry. And he seems like a guy. Like, I was, I grew up and I, I saw Fraser and I didn't know he was from Cheers until later. And then I saw some Cheers episodes. But the guy in Fraser doesn't seem like a guy who would go and drink beer at a bar in the basement in Boston. He seems like this uppity guy who drinks sherry with his brother. And that's just what they do. And 
but it, it I guess you could tie it back and see that he, he has these discriminating tastes as well and he's just exercising his right as a consumer yeah they did change his character a bit but I, I yeah. think you're right and, and you know, one is the product of the 80s and one is the product of the 90s yeah. and beyond right? so, but I think now if you tried to make it less accessible there would be just an enormous reaction oh yeah and as a consequence of, of that kind of consumption, it's hugely beneficial to provincial governments to have liquor stores. They oh, yeah. Billions of yes. dollars. This is, you know, we're sitting in a province that has the biggest alcohol distribution system in the world. And all that money that's going into the public coffers, if anyone talks about privatizing it, they're crazy. Right? Oh, yeah. It's, we, the, it's the fun tax. It's the luxury tax. That's yeah. People aren't even fully conscious of it. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be upset if I could go in and get, like, I went to New Hampshire last year, and we went into a, it was at the gas station, we stopped for gas, they had, a, they had a Dunkin' Donuts, so we got a dozen donuts, and they had beer, and the sticker on it said, it was 18 cans of Rolling Rock or something, and the, the sticker on it said 10 bucks, so I took it to the cash, and there was no tax, there was no deposit, I actually just gave the girl a $10 bill, and that was it. And I don't think I've ever been more excited about a purchase <laughs> in my life. That it, what it says on it is actually what I pay. Like if that was the case, I I wouldn't complain. But yeah, I mean, you know, we have a problem with we don't have enough money, or the government doesn't have enough money already. So if you cut out over a billion dollars, well, how are you gonna yeah. make that and, up? And remember, the beer stores aren't run by the government. They're run right. by the big breweries, yes. and they make lots of money off that. Yes. <laughs> which is which I was surprised when I first heard that. I, I always thought it was the government. But. Well, when Prohibition ended in the, in this province and most others, there was some arrangement to make beer, which was seen as the less of, lesser of evils, yeah. more accessible. So the brewers were allowed to have central warehouses that they ran themselves. The government inspected, nonetheless. Originally called Brewer's Warehouse, then called Brewer's Retail for many generations. And then as they're trying to hold on to their status and not get corner store yeah. <laughs> distribution, they renamed themselves the beer store. It's good branding. It's very good branding. You know, in some ways, the the threat of privatization was uh, enough to get those those two, the, the brewers and the, uh, the LCBO, to really expand what they were offering, making their mm-hmm. services much much better. Yeah. So I don't think it's a huge inconvenience to have to drive a little bit to go to a liquor store and no. to have a pretty good, you know, not always, but increasingly good-sized places with a good bunch of choices. Yeah. Um, and the beer store is a lot better than it used to be. Yeah, you can actually go and walk through and see it. Really, my local one, you can't. Um, no, sure. But the, the complaints are a lot of the, the microbreweries can, don't easily get their stock right. put in there. Yeah. Um, but the LCBO usually has. They, now that they've gotten into beer, you can find some of their more specialized stuff in there. Yeah. So. All right, last question. Saturday afternoon, it's 40 degrees outside. What are you having? My favorite beer is Cream or Springs. All right. And I would, if I was sitting out in a patio somewhere, that's what I would try and order. Uh, I must say, however, uh, against my normal policy, a week ago when I was at the cottage uh, with a friend, he brought um, gin and tonics. Okay. And they went down very smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> well, very nice. So white, that... wine, white wine will work too. Okay. Yeah, well, you got, yeah, you got to be classy. Or rose, actually. Oh, there you go. Great this, yeah. this summer. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate Great it. Thanks fun. for coming down. And so that is Craig Heron from York University, author of Booze, A Distilled History, the Sir John A. MacDonald Prize finalist. So you can pick that up. I was actually in Montreal last week walking down University Avenue, and a guy in a bike goes by, and that book was on the top of his uh, <laughs> on his basket and his bikes. It's, and it's a good That's read. Funny. It's definitely worth your time. And I, I did a course. I was teaing the course I te- I te- teed for two courses over the winter semester last year and in both classes people did prohibition papers so your book was referenced a lot it's definitely a good read to check it out if you want to email me about the podcast or any other items the email for the podcast is history slam at gmail.com i'm on twitter as well you can follow me there for all the fun stuff that i post or plan on posting uh at dr shawnee fever and until next time if you're out tonight and you see enrico palazzo please say hi for me Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Check out activehistory.ca for more features and articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.